Welcome to a collection of probability density functions with applications to random sampling. This is a video lesson of probability and statistics. Today we'll begin looking at our first continuous probability distribution, the normal distribution. As we'll see, the normal distribution can be used to model a great many measurement processes. This becomes particularly true when measurements are made in multiples, averaged, and then viewed through the central limit theorem, which we'll also introduce. Once we're done studying the normal distribution, we'll also introduce the chi-squared distribution and the t-distribution. In the case of all of the probability density functions that we're going to look at in this video lesson, they'll all have somewhat complex representative formulas. And when it comes to computing the probability of an event using the probability density function, we just have to remember that those probabilities are going to be expressed in terms of a definite integral. But all that integral means is that we're computing the area trapped between the graph of the probability density function and the interval that represents the event in question. In practice, we'll be using technology to compute those probabilities, but in principle, in this video, we'll just be representing them symbolically. There is a technological companion follow-up video to this video lesson, and it will demonstrate how to compute many of the probabilities and the examples from this video lesson using either MATLAB or a TI-84 plus calculator. So now we're going to define the normal distribution. So if we say that a random variable is normally distributed with a mean mu, and a standard deviation sigma, then we mean that the behavior of this random variable is modeled by a probability density function referred to as the normal distribution. And this normal distribution's probability density function does depend parametrically upon the mean and the standard deviation mu and sigma parameters, as well as directly upon the random variable x. The probability that a normal variable will be observed within the interval of x greater than a and less than b is just given by the definite integral of the normal distribution probability density function over that same interval. A graph of a typical normal distribution is depicted below and as you can see it's it's a bell-shaped curve. The mean is the value of the random variable x that lies directly below the maximum value along the normal curve. And the standard deviation is the distance along the x-axis. You must go either to the right or to the left of the mean in order to reach the location of the inflection points along the normal curve. And all an inflection point is, is a point along the curve where the curvature changes from being concave down to concave up. So different normal distributions corresponding to a different set of mean and standard deviation parameters are going to have different shapes. They're all going to be similar to what we're seeing in this picture though. They're all going to be bell-shaped curves with the mean corresponding to the peak and the mean plus or minus the standard deviation corresponding to the points of inflection. So all that will really change is the location of the mean and how steep or, or broad the curve actually is. And those are controlled by the mean and the standard deviation parameters. Now it turns out that a normally distributed random variable with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma may always be rescaled to another normally distributed random variable z with a mean value of 0 and a standard deviation of exactly 1. And we'll state this as a theorem that we're going to not offer a proof for today, but it's a fairly elementary proof. If x is a normally distributed random variable with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, then z is equal to the quantity x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation is also a normally distributed random variable, but it has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So accordingly, the probability density function for this variable z is called the standard normal distribution. And it's just the normal distribution with the mean and standard deviation parameters set exactly to 0 and 1. When we get into a task called random sampling a little bit later, 
we'll see that the standard normal distribution and a z random variable can be particularly useful there. Now by design, the shape parameters for the normal distribution are fairly simple. The mean of the normal distribution or the theoretical mean is just the mean parameter and the variance is just the square of the standard deviation parameter. Same with the standard deviation, it is its own parameter. Skewness is equal to zero because the normal distribution is perfectly symmetric about its mean and kurtosis is always equal to three regardless of what the other values of the mean or the standard deviation are. And so for this reason, a kurtosis of three is somewhat of a benchmark that's used for comparing the behavior of other probability distributions to the normal distribution. So if we see a distribution that has a kurtosis that's greater than three, we typically interpret that to mean that the, the um, outliers of that distribution are more important than they are in the normal distribution. And if they're less, the outliers are less prominent than they are in the normal distribution. In other words, the tails are either heavier or lighter in those cases. We'll begin to explore how to compute probabilities with the normal distribution through an example. This first one's a little bit contrived, but once we get through it, we'll put some additional structure in place that will allow us to see how the normal distribution is actually used in practice. But for now, an automotive engineer has determined that the fuel economy for a prototype of a new truck can be modeled with a normally distributed random variable with a mean of 17.3 miles per gallon and a standard deviation of 2.7. This accounts for variations in fuel economy that result from different driving conditions. When asked what the probability is that the fuel economy would fall between 15 and 16 miles per gallon at any particular moment, she responded by performing the following calculation. The probability that x is between 15 and 16 is just equal to the definite integral of the normal distribution parameterized with a mean of 17.3 and a standard deviation of 2.7. And if you were to use a technological tool to evaluate this integral, you should find that the probability is about 0.1179. In the last example, we calculated the probability of an event that could be represented as an interval that was bounded on both ends. Not all events are going to be representable that way, and we'll see that in this next example. A census worker has learned that human life expectancy in his area of study is a normally distributed random variable with a mean value of 81.35 years and a standard deviation of 11.64 years. Therefore, the probability any given person in that region will live more than 90 years is the probability that x is greater than 90. This will equal the definite integral of the normal distribution parameterized with a mean of 81.35 and a standard deviation of 11.64. Over the interval, x is greater than 90 and less than infinity, so those become the limits on our definite integral. And if you were to use a technological tool to calculate that definite integral, you should find that you get a probability of about 0.2287. Our previous examples were somewhat artificial because they explicitly told you that x was a normally distributed random variable. You will rarely have this knowledge about a measurement in practice. Instead, you'll have to decide for yourself if the random variable you're interested in can truly be said to be normally distributed. There are many approaches to doing this, but for now what we will do is appeal to a concept known as the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is a deep theorem with far-reaching consequences. In order to explore it, we'll begin by motivating it with an example. However, before we can introduce this theorem, we'll need to establish some introductory framework. We'll begin by defining a random sample. Let x1, x2, all the way up through xn represent a sequence of independent observations of a random variable, and all these observations are distributed according to the same probability distribution then this set of observations is called a random sample. And along with that, a statistic is a random variable that's computed by a function that depends upon the observations in the random sample. It could be all of them, it could be some of them. 
two commonly used statistics are the sample mean and the sample variance. So the sample mean is defined as follows. If we have x1, x2, all the way up through xn that constitute a random sample, then the sample mean is just defined to be the arithmetic mean of those, those observations. So it's the sum of the values divided by the total number of them that are there. We usually represent a sample mean with the symbol x bar. We can define the sample variance in a similar way. If we let x1, x2, all the way up through xn be a random sample, then the sample variance is just defined to be the sum of the squares of the deviations between each value in the sample and the mean of the sample. And we take that sum and divide it by n minus 1, the number of elements in the sample minus 1, in other words. Similarly, the sample standard deviation is just defined to be the square root of the sample variance. Now, just as an aside, if you've got a good memory and you're maybe paying attention, you might recall that we've already encountered formulas for a variance and a standard deviation of a data set. And those are slightly different from these formulas for the variance and standard deviation of a sample. In particular, the denominators are equal to the number of elements in the sample minus one rather than just the number of elements in the sample. And there's a good reason for that. And we'll get into that reason a little bit later on when we start studying parameter estimation. But for now, we're just going to take that as a definition. A central question of inferential statistics is to determine probability distributions that describe the variation in various statistics. Such probability distributions are called sampling distributions, and we'll define them formally here. A sampling distribution f of theta is a probability distribution that describes the variation in a statistic theta computed from a random sample, x1, x2, all the way up through xn. To see why sampling distributions are important and useful, consider this scenario. Suppose you are interested in making measurements that you suspect are distributed in an arbitrary, decidedly erratic way. The distribution for these measurements, f of x, may be non-symmetric and even have several peaks. For the sake of being definite, suppose that the mean of this distribution, or its expected value of x relative to that distribution, is 4.6224. And the standard deviation, or the root of the expected value of the square of the deviation of the random variable from its mean, is 2.4769. An example of what such a distribution might look like is on the next slide, but just bear in mind that there are many possibilities, because there are infinitely many distributions that we could dream up to describe the variation in some variable x, even though we might know its theoretical mean and standard deviation. The distribution in our next slide, though, is going to be decidedly unlike the normal distribution. And so here's the probability density function, the distribution for x. We can see it's very non-normal. There's three major peaks to it that's not even close to being symmetric, probably has pretty small kurtosis to it. It's, it's not normal at all. It, it's a specialized distribution that would probably only be attached to this measurement that we're imagining, so it's unlikely that it would even have a name. Well, not knowing much about the distribution f of x becomes a real problem if you want to draw inferences about the behavior of your measurements that are represented by the random variable x. So what we're going to describe next is an alternative way of looking at things that will still, in a sense, allow us to draw inferences, draw conclusions about the behavior of our measurements. And what it requires us to do is collect a sample of measurements rather than just a single measurement. So we're going to consider an experiment in which we collect random samples of n measurements, each x1 through xn, from this distribution. And then we're going to average each of them, obtaining values for the statistic x bar. Each one of these samples results in a slightly different value of x bar. So we might consider that x bar is itself a random variable, that there's going to be some variation to its value. We might investigate the way that x bar is distributed. 
If we were to repeat the experiment of collecting a sample of n measurements from the original erratic distribution 10,000 times and keep a running histogram as we go of the mean values x bar that we compute from each of the samples, then a picture of how x bar is distributed should begin to emerge in our histogram after a while. The histogram that we're going to look at is going to be rescaled in height so that it represents the probability density rather than frequency. In other words, we're going to divide the bar height on the, the absolute frequency histogram by the total number of observations so that we get relative frequencies. And this process is going to be depicted on the next slide. So what we're looking at is a sequence of snapshots of the relative frequency histogram of our sample means as we collect more and more samples. So it's what the histogram looks like in an emergent way as we collect more samples. So the first image on the top left represents what would happen if we were to collect 10 samples of five observations of x each, compute the sample mean of each of those 10 samples, and then place those resulting sample means into a histogram. It's a pretty sparse histogram, so we probably can't learn much from that, other than there does appear to be a mean somewhere between four and five that the, the observations of the sample means are clustering around. So as we move through our sequence of pictures, we see what happens as we add more samples and hence more sample means to our histogram. We go to 100 and we're getting a more bell-shaped histogram. We go to 1,000 samples and it looks even better, and 10,000 samples looks even better still. You can actually start seeing a shape that might look suspiciously normal. If we remember what the shape of the normal distribution looks like, we could almost imagine imposing an envelope of the normal distribution curve over top of the relative frequency histogram that we've established. So these are empirical probability distributions, but what we're talking about doing is imagining what would happen if we tried to fit a theoretical probability distribution to it. A natural question to ask would be, how well would that work? How well would it work, in other words, to fit a normal distribution to the empirical distribution that has emerged by forming relative frequency histograms of our increasing set of sample means. So we pay closer attention to the histogram that resulted from 10,000 samples. It's possible to see that the normal distribution with a mean set equal to the theoretical mean of our original distribution f of x and a standard deviation set equal to something that's going to seem a little bit unmotivated right now. It's set equal to 1 over the square root of 5 times the theoretical standard deviation of our original distribution f of x. And so we'll talk about where that 1 over square root of 5 comes from, but remember there were five observations of each of our samples, so it's going to be related to that. So if we do that, that particular normal distribution calibrated with that particular mean and standard deviation is going to fit our empirical distribution quite well, at least as far as our eye can see. And you can observe that agreement in our figure because the graph that's represented by the red curve is the graph of that normal distribution with those parameters. And it does seem to agree pretty well with the shape of the empirical histogram that we've already measured. So there's something very general and powerful at work here, and we're going to state it in the form of a theorem called the central limit theorem. So suppose x1, x2, all the way up through xn is an independent, identically distributed random sample of size n with a probability distribution of f of x. Now, if all we know about f of x is that its mean is mu and its variance is sigma squared, some finite value, then the probability distribution for the random variable x bar, not x itself, but the sample mean of our, of our sample, approaches the normal distribution with a mean value of mu, so the same theoretical mean as our distribution f of x, and a standard deviation of 
sigma, so the standard deviation of the original distribution f, divided by the square root of the sample size. And we say that this normal distribution is the sampling distribution for the sample mean. Now, as an aside, the value for the standard deviation that appears in the central limit theorem, or, or sigma over root n, appears frequently enough that it has a name. And we call it the standard error of the random sample. And so that's where the mysterious square root of 5 came from in the motivating example we just looked at. Now, the central limit theorem has pretty heavy implications. In particular, it tells us that if we've got some measurement, some arbitrary measurement that we're making, and we don't know much about how that measurement is distributed, we can still draw inferences and conclusions about the variations in that measurement if we're willing to relax our expectations a little bit and draw our inferences or conclusions about the variation in means of samples of those measurements rather than the measurement itself. And that can still be pretty useful because a lot of times we make repeated observations of a measurement anyway in order to control some of the measurement error that we might experience. So we'll illustrate that with an example. A market researcher is analyzing the results of an experiment in which the heights of random samples of 10 people were measured. Even though the researcher does not have a model for the distribution of height measurements, she has already estimated that the mean of this unknown distribution is 5.6934 and the standard deviation is 0 0.7999. The researcher hopes to determine the probability of obtaining a sample of heights with a mean greater than 6 feet. Since her sample size is n equals 10, she invokes the central limit theorem and concludes that the variation in the sample means is described by a normal distribution with a mean parameter of 5.6934, the same as her original distribution, and a standard deviation that's just equal to the standard error of the sample, or 0 0.7999, the standard deviation of the theoretical distribution, divided by the root of 10, the root of the sample size. And this comes out to be just a little bit over a quarter, 0 0.2530. With that in mind, she's able to conclude that the probability that the mean of any given sample of 10 height measurements greater than 6 feet is equal to the definite integral of the normal distribution parameterized by a mean of 5.6934 and a standard deviation of 0 0.2530 over the interval of 6 up through infinity. And if you were to use a technological tool to compute that definite integral, you should find that it comes out to be about 0.1128. Now there's a related theorem that's worth knowing that ties this idea of random sampling back to the standard normal distribution. So if x1, x2, up through xn is a random sample taken from a normally distributed population with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, then the sample mean x bar is a statistic for which the normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation equal to the standard error standard deviation divided by the root of the sample size, is its sampling distribution. And this is true, not approximately, but exactly, regardless of how large or small the sample size may be. In other words, z equal to the sample mean minus the theoretical mean, all divided by the standard error, is distributed according to the standard normal distribution. So let's consider an example in order to investigate how that theorem might be used. A water quality technician is attempting to assess claims made by a property owner that they have addressed problems with their septic system and that the nitrate levels down gradient from their system are now averaging at 10 parts per million. The technician takes 20 independent nitrate measurements from a test well down gradient of the septic system and finds the following levels in parts per million. And this is a data set that we represent with the variable d, and we, as we can see that there's, there's um, 20 different nitrate measurements in it of different values. Well, he computes the mean of this sample to find that x bar is 
about 12.5824. Now from an earlier analysis, the technician knows that the standard deviation in the nitrate measurements is, is uh, sigma is equal to 2.3. With this information and the landowner's claim that the down gradient nitrate con concentrations are now averaging at 10 parts per million, this serves as a surrogate for the theoretical mean of mu equals 10, and the technician computes a z statistic for the sample. He finds that z is equal to x bar minus mu divided by the standard error comes out to be about 5.0213. The technician plots the standard normal probability density function and sees that this value of z lies well above the true mean in the upper tail or low probability region of the distribution. So that should give rise to some intuition that the landowners claim that nitrate measurements are averaging around 10 parts per million is unlikely to be true. But in order to quantify this, we can observe that the probability that z should be found at or above the value that she calculated is going to be quite small. So in other words, we're asking the equivalent of how likely is it that we should be taking a bunch of measurements that are going to have a mean that are as large or larger than what we've observed, given that the landowner's claim is that they should be averaging it at, at 10 parts per million. So we compute that by calculating the definite integral of the standard normal distribution from z equals 5.0213 all the way up to infinity. And it produces a very small probability, 2.5665 times 10 to the negative 7. So the technician decides that the homeowner's claim is unlikely to be true. Well, now we're ready to introduce our next probability density function, which is the chi-squared distribution. So previously, we saw that the normal distribution serves as a sampling distribution for the sample means of random samples taken from certain populations. It would be nice to also have a sampling distribution for sample variances as well. We'll see that the chi-squared distribution fills that role, and we'll introduce it here without any derivation. Now the chi-squared probability density function is another one of these probability density functions that's defined in a somewhat complex way in terms of special mathematical functions. And the good news is, is that it's built into many scientific calculators and, and uh, mathematical and statistical software packages. So as is the case with the normal distribution, when it comes time to compute probabilities with the chi-squared distribution, we'll just be able to do it with technology. That said, we'll still state the chi-squared distribution in terms of its formula here. So a continuous random variable x is said to be distributed according to the chi-squared distribution with new degrees of freedom. It's the Greek letter nu that looks sort of like a v. If x has the following probability density function, so f sub chi-squared parameterized by nu and depending on the random variable x is equal to this kind of complex quantity. It's 1 over 2 to the power of nu over 2 times the gamma function applied to nu over 2 times x raised to the power of nu minus 2 over 2 times e to the negative x over 2 if x is positive. And then the, the chi-squared distribution is 0 for all other values. So the gamma function is just it's one of these special mathematical functions that you encounter sometimes. And it's defined here on the screen. What it is and how it works isn't so important for our applications. If you want to think about what it means in a loose sense, the gamma function is kind of a continuous version of the factorial. Now the chi-squared distribution, like really any distribution that we're going to study, has its own set of shape parameters that you can compute theoretical formulas for, and I'm just summarizing them here in a table. So the mean of the chi-squared distribution is equal to the degree of freedom parameter, nu. The variance is equal to 2 times nu, so the standard deviation is equal to the square root of that. The skewness is equal to the root of 8 over nu, 
and the kurtosis is equal to 12 plus 3 nu all over nu. Well, now we can view graphs of the chi-squared probability density function with selected values of the nu parameter, or the degree of freedom parameter, depicted in the figure below. If nu is small, such as nu equals 1, we get a very sharp and steep probability density function with its peak clustered down towards 0, and that's represented by the blue graph. A more moderate value of nu equals 10 gives us the red curve that starts to be more of an asymmetric bell curve that increases from 0 up to just about 10 and then decreases somewhat exponentially to the right. However, the bigger that nu gets as we go out towards nu equals 50, we see that the peak drops in amplitude, it shifts to the right, and the graph becomes more and more symmetric. So those are the typical behaviors that we'll see out of a chi-squared distribution's probability density function. Now that we know what the chi-squared distribution is, we should investigate one of its more important uses through three fundamental theorems. And that use is statistical inference related to sample variance as opposed to sample mean. So our first theorem states that if x is a standard normal random variable, then the square of x is distributed according to the chi-squared distribution with just one degree of freedom. Now that theorem by itself isn't particularly useful for our purposes in, in any direct way. However, it provides a theoretical foundation for the next couple of theorems, which become gradually more useful. More generally, we can state the following theorem. If x1, x2, all the way up through xn are independent, standard, normal observations of a random variable, then if we form the statistic chi-squared equal to the sum of the squares of those observations, then chi-squared is distributed according to the chi-squared distribution with n degrees of freedom. If we remember that a sample variance is computed in a way that involves finding a sum of squares of observations within that sample, then we can kind of imagine how the previous theorem might be useful at establishing a probability density function for describing the variation that can be found among different sample variances. And that's really the subject of this final, more useful theorem. It says that if x bar and s squared are the sample mean and sample variance of a random sample of size n taken from some normal population with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared, then x bar and s squared are independent random variables, and then the random variable chi squared defined to be n minus 1 times s squared divided by sigma squared is distributed according to a chi squared distribution with nu equal n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The quantity chi squared is called the chi squared statistic, and we'll use it to assess whether a sample variance deviates significantly from a theoretical variance. Standard deviation directly and variance indirectly are commonly used measures of error in the sense that they describe the variation of a measured quantity about its mean value. For this reason, these statistics are often tracked in various manufacturing processes for the purposes of quality control assessment. In many cases, overly large values of the standard deviation or variance and critical measurements related to a manufactured product correspond to unacceptable lapses in production quality. The chi-squared distribution can be used to model quality control assessment schemes. The basic idea is to choose a maximum acceptable value for the true standard deviation and the critical measurements and occasionally make random samples of the critical measurement for n of the manufactured objects. Chi-squared distribution can be used to assess whether or not variations in the sample's standard deviation in comparison to the maximum acceptable value can be considered significant. One approach to this practice is featured in the following example. Standard deviation is regularly used as a measure of error or variability. 
To illustrate this, a manufacturer of gold ingots desires to maintain a high degree of consistency in the mass of the ingots they produce. The mean weight of the ingots is taken to be 1,000 grams. The plant manager will consider that the production consistency of gold ingots is out of tolerance if he has reason to believe that the true value of the standard deviation of ingot masses is more than 0 0.001 grams. In order to determine whether or not this is the case, the plant manager requires that an occasional sample of 25 ingots will be randomly sampled so that their masses may be precisely measured. Suppose one such sample is collected and its sample standard deviation turns out to be 0 0.0015. The chi-squared statistic for this scenario is chi-squared equals n minus 1 times the sample variance divided by the theoretical variance, which comes out to be 24 times 0 0.0015 squared divided by 0 0.001 squared. And if you compute that with a calculator, you'll find that it's 54. So the chi-squared distribution with nu equal 24 degrees of freedom describes the variation of the sample variances. This distribution is depicted on the next slide. So the graph that we're looking at is of the chi-squared distribution with 24 degrees of freedom, a value of nu equal 24. And there's a few values of chi-squared marked with vertical bars on this graph. The first, or the, the red bar, is the chi-squared value that corresponds to a standard deviation of 0 0.001. So this is the benchmark standard deviation that we've set to represent when things become out of tolerance. Now, relative to that, there's a purple vertical bar that corresponds to the chi-squared value that's computed from a sample standard deviation of 0 0.0015. And this is way out in the upper tail of our current chi-squared distribution. So that should indicate that we're probably looking at a sample that we wouldn't expect if its variability was in control relative to this threshold standard deviation of 0 0.001. Well, we can quantify this idea a little bit with probability. Using the chi-squared distribution with nu equal 24 degrees of freedom, the plant manager determined that the probability of observing a sample of ingots of this size with the same or greater amount of variability in their masses is the definite integral of the chi-squared probability density function calibrated with nu equal 24 degrees of freedom over the interval from 54 all the way up to infinity. And if you were to use technology like a calculator or perhaps MATLAB to compute that probability, you should find that it's quite low. It's 4.2 6, 2, 4 times 10 to the negative 4. So with this in mind, the plant manager would be well justified in concluding that this sample is indicative that production quality might be out of tolerance. There's too much variability in the masses of the gold ingots in that particular sample. Well, now we'll introduce our final probability density function that we'll need to work with for a while. So if we continue the thread that concluded our first look at the normal distribution in the central limit theorem, there's going to be circumstances where we'll want to make statistical inferences about the means of samples we've collected, but the sizes of those samples, they're just simply not big enough for our purposes. Moreover, it's also quite common that we will not know or have a reasonable estimate for the variance of the population that the samples were taken from. In those situations, we're not meeting the requirements set by the central limit theorem. So we'll not be justified in claiming that the normal distribution is an adequate sampling distribution for the means of our random samples. One way of restating the central limit theorem is to say that if x1, x2, all the way through xn forms a random sample taken from the population with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, then the statistic t equals x minus mu all over the standard error is a normally distributed random variable with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. In other words, it follows a standard normal distribution. In situations where the sample is small, 
and taken from a normally distributed population of unknown variants, we might be tempted to define a similar statistic in which we replace the standard deviation parameter sigma with the sample standard deviation s, t equals x minus mu over s divided by the square root of n. This statistic is commonly known as the t-statistic, and its variation can be described by what is commonly known as the t-distribution. On the following slide, we'll state the formula for the t-distribution without derivation. Let y and z be independent random variables. If y has a chi-squared distribution with new degrees of freedom, and z follows a standard normal distribution, then the continuous random variable t equals z over the square root of y over nu is said to be distributed according to the t distribution with new degrees of freedom. The random variable t has the following probability density function. f sub t of nu and t is equal to the gamma function applied to nu plus 1 over 2 divided by the root of nu times pi times the gamma function applied to nu over 2 times the quantity 1 plus t squared over nu raised to the power of negative nu plus 1 over 2. This is another fairly complicated representation of a probability density function and we'll use it but we'll typically use it through technology so computations that we do with the t distribution are going to be done with a calculator or mathematical software. Like any distribution we've looked at, the t-distribution has a set of theoretical shape parameters and they're summarized in the table you're looking at now. The mean is zero. The variance is equal to the number of degrees of freedom divided by the number of degrees of freedom divided by two. The standard deviation is equal to the root of the variance. The skewness is zero because it's a symmetric distribution and the kurtosis is equal to 6 over the degrees of freedom minus 4, all plus 3. Graphs of the t probability density function with selected values of nu, or degrees of freedom, are depicted in the figure below. So if, if we look at a relatively small number of degrees of freedom, nu equal 5, for instance, that corresponds to a relatively, or comparatively, flatter and broader bell-shaped curve. However, as the number of degrees of freedom increase to 10 and 100, which produce the red and then yellow graphs, the T distribution begins to gradually steepen and the tails begin to gradually flatten. What we would eventually learn is that the higher the number of degrees of freedom, the closer this distribution gets to a standard normal distribution. As already mentioned, one of the most important applications of the t-distribution is as a sampling distribution for the sample means of small samples drawn from a normal population with unknown variants. To see why this is, consider the following theorem. We'll let x bar and s squared be the sample mean and sample variance from a random sample of n observations taken from a normal population with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Then t equals x bar minus mu over s divided by the root of n is distributed according to the t distribution with nu equal n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So the value of the previous t sampling distribution theorem is that the t statistic it describes, or t equal the sample mean minus the theoretical mean, all divided by the sample standard deviation over the root of n, depends only on the sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample size, and population mean. It does not depend on the population variance. This is useful because it allows us to perform inferential statistics about the population mean once we've taken the sample from a normal population, even though we might not know the population variance. This would have been impossible if we had tried the same approach with the standard normal z statistic, which does depend on the theoretical population variance. I'm going to illustrate how we would use the t-distribution as a sampling distribution for sample means through an example. 
an agricultural engineer is investigating the performance claims made by a chemical company that produces fertilizers. They state that under typical conditions, addition of their fertilizer to a one acre plot of potatoes will result in an average yield of 32.8 thousand pounds. The engineer prepares five separate one acre plots and applies the fertilizer to all of them. At the end of the growing season, these fields yield 29.28, 28.84, 28.86, 28 28.47, and 30.84 thousand pounds of potatoes, respectively. The engineer calculates the sample mean and variance of this data to find that X bar equals 29.26 and S equals 0.9297. Then she computes the t-statistic for this data with nu equal n minus 1 equal 4 degrees of freedom and the claimed average yield of mu equal 32.8 thousand pounds per acre. t equals x bar minus mu divided by s over the root of n turns out to be negative 8.5192. The fact that t is less than zero reflects the fact that the sample mean lies below the proposed true mean of 32.8 thousand pounds per acre. You should think about why this is. So she plots the t distribution for nu equals n minus 1 equals 4 degrees of freedom and observes that t equals negative 8.5192 is well out into the lower tail, the low probability region. We'll see this depicted on the next slide. So as you can see, t equals negative 8.5192 lies so far to the left of the peak of the t distribution in this figure that it's almost indistinguishable from the t-axis itself. This means that the probability density in that region is quite close to zero. This should provide some intuition that the sample that we've seen the agricultural engineer collect seems to have an improbably low value for its mean but we'll quantify that in the next slide by computing a probability. She computes the probability of obtaining a sample with a t statistic at least as extreme as the one she computed. That is, she finds the probability that t is less than or equal to negative 8.5192 given that we have a t statistic with four degrees of freedom. And that turns out to be the definite integral of the t probability density function calibrated with nu equal four degrees of freedom over the interval from negative infinity to negative 8.5192. If you were to calculate that with a calculator or mathematical software, you'd find that you'd get a probability approximately equal to 5.2097 times 10 to the negative four. The fact that this probability is small suggests that it's unlikely that mu equal 32.8 thousand pounds per acre is an accurate value for the true average yield in light of the performance of the five sample fields that she has prepared and harvested. In short, the agricultural engineer has found some evidence that supports the idea that there's an inconsistency between what the chemical company is advertising and what she has found on a somewhat consistent basis within her five fields. This is something that would be worthy of additional study in order to find a cause for. That brings us to the end of this video lesson on a collection of probability density functions. Hopefully you found it informative and useful, and we look forward to having you join the next video lesson. Our next video lesson will be a technological companion to this video lesson in which we revisit most of the examples we've worked through here, but through the aid of a TI calculator or MATLAB so that we can see how to do the actual computations of probabilities using our three distributions in practice.